50 hours a month of clinical work. So I've, I've been clinically active. I think I had evolved a therapy model that worked well for my personality and I was effective. I'd say probably, you know, 50% of the cases that really helped someone, 30% it made no difference, 20% got worse. But, you know, overall, I think I helped a lot of people. Those were not formal outcomes. No, no, no. <laughs> but I didn't have a home, a theoretical home, mm -hmm. and I didn't have a theoretical guide. Mm -hmm. It was all gut from my gut and experience, mm -hmm. you know, kind of um, a uh, experienced wise gut, hopefully. And so when I started reading some EFT stuff and I actually saw more and more students would choose for their qualifying exams at Syracuse to write on EFT. Mm -hmm. And I lived three hours from Ottawa. Mm -hmm. I really, uh, well, for me, I would experience as a prompting to say, you better take advantage of that while you have a chance. And so, you know, I went up to Ottawa, spent a week there with Sue in Ottawa. And then went back and spent two days at the advanced externship in Ottawa. And the more I studied, the more I felt, yeah, this is what I believe. This is what I've seen works. I mean, it really works. And this is what, um, you know, I want to be. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing that. And then just because of the way my mind works, I said, well, I want to know how people experience this transition. Because it's been hard for me. Because it's, it's largely a nurturing female way of being, mm -hmm. traditionally. Right. You and mean the, the role of a therapist in that? Well, it's it's Sue. Yeah. It is Sue. And she's fabulous. And she's one of a kind. She's a pioneer of a generation, really. But So how can I be me, kind of a hyperactive, intense speaking, white male EFT mm -hmm. therapist? So I did, we did a study. I mean, a graduate student did a study of 124 people who had become certified EFT therapists about their journey into becoming an EFT therapist mm -hmm. because I was interested. So that's another place that research came in, which we have the first one submitted, it's under review, we have a second article looking at it. But what it said to me is that I want to be more integrated and consistent across the work I do in all areas of my life. Mm -hmm. I want to be the kind of person I do research the, the things I'm most interested in, in my home life. Mm -hmm. So for me, I found a home in EFT and it's rigorous research. I mean, it's a it's not a fading model mm -hmm. that is, if soon as, you know, heaven forbid, but when Sue passes, it's going to continue. The research is there. It's effective versus some of these other models that have been flash pan guru driven, right? And so the research matters to me. Prior to, uh, well, let me just ask, would you yeah. say that, that finding a home in EFT has also, um, I guess in a way, determined your research agenda? Oh, it has. Absolutely. It's definitely influenced the I've always done, uh, see before, I've always done marriage and health, marriage and mental health. I've done diabetes, depression. But what happened is I didn't really ever, with the, say the RDAS or any of these measures, I never really, really captured mm -hmm. what is the essence, which is attachment. Mm -hmm. And so for me now, everything I'm doing is attachment driven. When I'm looking at negative marital interaction in couples, I'm trying to throw in an attachment measure whenever mm -hmm. I can. We do created an attachment measure with Dean Busby, myself, and Sue um, that looks at a nine-item screen of how you experience attachment in your relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm reading that literature. So even what I don't know how to measure, we're trying to create a way to measure it. Now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess it has – the question you asked has made me think. Yes, it's absolutely driven my research agenda. I'm still health – Marriage and health driven, that's what I want to study. Right. But now I'm looking at it from an attachment. But everything which, is under that uh, backdrop. Uh -huh. right? which, yeah, it's a great question, yes. Okay. Um, anything else that you might add about uh, the, the intersection of, of clinical and, and research? You're also an educator, obviously, yeah. and maybe you've had experiences where, where you see students get it, some students don't get it, or uh, what, what has been helpful for students in understanding that intersection? Well, for me, I think it's mentoring. I had a great mentor that said, look, what we do is important. We need to find ways to show that it's important because in addition to having some magic in the room, we need some research that shows that. So since those early days of mentoring, I've always had a foot in either EFT, in either MFT outcome research or now EFT processes and how they predict health and marital health. So I always think about that. How will this influence us? And and as a result, I think because I'm clinically active, I see clients, and because I try to do clinical research, I think in the end that's helped me be a better educator because I don't feel I'm removed at all from what I'm teaching the students how to do. I feel like I'm in the trench, and I have been since I graduated. Yeah. And you, going back a little bit to something you said, that, that you spend a lot of time, you're clinically active, 30 to 60 yeah. hours a month. And, um, how do you... 
I guess I hope this isn't too leading, yeah. but how do you view your time as a clinician in vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your research head? Yeah. Um, like when you're sitting in, in with clients, are yeah. you thinking about research studies? Are you? Are, are oh yeah, oh yeah. And and one of the things, the best indicator to me is when people ask me about my job who aren't in my field. What do I say? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the litmus test, litmus test. Or if you really want to know what I think, say to me. What did you say to Sharon about this event? I mean, those are two areas I know. Sharon's your spouse. Yeah, right. and so, I, yeah. Not your department head or anything. No, like I have so. the privilege of being to share. <laughs> so w one of the things that I learned from that is that I say to people when they come to my office or they're touring campus, this is our clinic, this is where I work, and this is where we see clients. And they'll say, do you see clients? Yes, I see clients right here in my office. Well, why do you do that? Because you can't really teach and research on a topic that you're not actively involved in. And I say to them, one of the things I like most about my field is that accreditation standards require that I be clinically active. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've said that many, many, many times. So yes, I think that the best research projects, like one we did at Syracuse, is we had a lot of international students and their dropout rates of their students because of English as a second language seemed to be higher. So we were talking one day in supervision, clinical supervision, well, we could study that We've got the clinic data. Let's go back and see the people who did intake, talk to their therapist, but never came to therapy. Mm -hmm. Let's find out from them why they didn't come to therapy. Mm -hmm. So we researched that. Hard group to get, by the way. We had 500 mm -hmm. people in that category and got 30 to respond mm -hmm. because the people who don't come to therapy don't participate in therapy right, clinical right. research. But we found out that language was way down on the list. It was being videotaped. It was working with students, and it was because it was in the middle of campus. Mm -hmm. And then we published that in the Journal of Contemporary Family Therapy. So yeah, I mean, right out of clinical practice, studies emerge. Okay. Because we were interested. We needed to know. Do you, do you ever have the experience where a couple might be presenting you with a clinical dilemma or a client presenting you with a clinical dilemma and you think, wow, I don't know of any research about this. And, oh, yeah. then, and then you start thinking and formulating a, oh, yeah. a rudimentary design or something like that. And I saw an interview at a live EFT training that I was helping in. And I contacted the therapist and got the permission of the couple and talked to them and said, I'd really like to interview you about what you said in that session mm -hmm. because I think it's something a lot of families struggle with. Mm -hmm. Now, for, unfortunately, I never did get that completed with them. But, yeah, those kind of things happen all the time. I, to me, they're not two separate worlds at all. And if, if MFT didn't exist and if I wasn't required to practice, I would still practice because of my passion and because how it drives my research. I think yeah. the most irrelevant research studies in our field are driven by non-clinical issues. Can you give an example? You said the most irrelevant, the ones yeah. that don't matter the most. When you have basic human process studies that have no clinical application. Mm -hmm. So it would be a straight set relational satisfaction mm -hmm. predicting relational satisfaction, <laughs> right, versus interaction predicting health, predicting child outcomes, predicting truancy, things that matter, things that people care about outside of us. So, so year of students experience with type of supervisor's model. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Besides, like Rick Miller said last night, besides the 18 of us in our field who read that, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you put a study out there that says, if there is a low attachment level between partners affects child's grades in school. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about something that matters. Mm -hmm. And something that people see clinically. You see that all the time. Drop off the 12 year old, my kid's failing out of school. Mm -hmm. Well if you can't connect how the marriage is affecting, the, then you're not really an MFT in my mind. Mm -hmm. Either you can connect it research or clinically. But we know and believe that that's true, that it matters. So that, that's how it makes sense. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome.